And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Father, we thank you. Lord, I ask that you take these next few minutes, Lord, to minister to our heart. Lord, I pray, Lord, for, for a special unction of your anointing, Lord, this morning. To reach into the depths, the depths of our, of our, of our being, Lord God. That you would teach us spiritual truth that we would grow thereby. I pray for every person here, Holy Spirit. And I ask that you would move in signs and wonders in their life. That you would become more real to them today than you've ever been before in their life. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Go ahead and take your chairs this morning. Authority. When you look at this scripture, it reaps authority. Jesus looks at the, at the ocean, the water, and, and speaks to it. Now, if, if you've seen your pastor go to uh, Memorial Lake right here, or the Memorial Lake, what do you call it? The Lake of Palmer Lake, yeah, Palmer Lake at Memorial Park. And if you've seen me talking to it, you probably think I was crazy, right? Well, he was talking to the ocean. And that word authority is the power to enforce laws. And since Jesus created all laws, he, he, had, he had a different type of uh, enforcement uh, strategy. That authority means to command, to determine, to judge, or to exact obedience. Authority, one that is invested with, with this power. Authority. Power assigned to another. I can give you my authority. Authority, power to influence or persuade resulting from knowledge or experience. So here, here he is and Jesus walks out to the ocean and he speaks to the sea. And when you think about it, when I think about it, uh, I hear the cries of people. Psalms 28.2 is a good a good scripture in it. And it says, Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help. And, and I really believe that Jesus, as he walks in us, walks with us, those ears are our ears, and we should be hearing those cries of mercy. But the, the sad part would be this, is we hear the cries of mercy, but we can do nothing about it. I, I don't ever want to be in that position where I hear, I hear someone who needs help, but I can't help them. So there's a danger when one, when one fails to hear the cries. And I guess I can ask us, do we hear the weakest cry or the cry of the weakest in our community? Uh, that's what it's all about. Why, why, do, why would we come to church if we weren't going to reach out to the weakest in our community? To help somebody. If, if all we did was jump, gather to, to enjoy each other's company, well, that in itself is okay, but that is not an end all. That, that shouldn't be why we come together to enjoy each other's company. We should come together and enjoy each other's company so that we can do something beyond that. See, this authority calms the high seas. And we were talking about that because when you look at the community, when you look at life, when you look at society in general, it, it's wild, brutal. You, you, you see things on the news now, uh, shootings, which is the other day in Santa Monica, shooting here, and shooting there, and stabbing here. And it, just, it, it, it goes on and on and on. If these are not high seas, if this is not a time where we need to be able to step into a situation and calm, and calm that situation, then there's never been a time. It says there in verse 39, and I'm going to try to get to where I'm going to get. It says, He arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, and this is the key, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly 
and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey? So this lesson culminates Jesus' class that he gave the people. More importantly, he exacts more truth on death to his disciples. If you go back, verse 1, let's read that. I'm going to lay some groundwork here of Mark chapter 4. It said, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and he sat in it uh, and he went out on the lake. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow seed. So he, in verse 4, he, he gets on the lake and he begins to tell them stories, if you will. Parables. And he began with the parable of the farmer. Prior to him telling this story, he was in somebody's house. He was in a house prior to get to the lake. And in Mark 3, he, he had an experience that, that probably uh, put him on a bummer. And this, this is what happens when you begin to get real deep with God. He was accused of being crazy. Chapter 3, you, you can read it later, but you don't have to get there. He said, this guy's crazy. He's lost his mind. They actually said that he was a friend of Satan. Oh, this can't be a God. This guy is of the devil. That he's crazy. He's of the devil. And then his family tried to take him home because they had thought he had lost his mind. So first the people thought he was crazy. Then they said he was of the devil. And now his own family, his mom, his dad, his brothers, they came to get him to Jesus. You've lost your mind. You're nuts. We need to take you home. So earlier that day, Jesus had, had healed a man with a withered hand. And he began to move in, in, in the miraculous. So this is the same day that he told everybody who his family was. He said, Jesus, your family's here. They're outside. I remember, they wanted him because they thought he was crazy. And he goes, my family. And he points to the people in the house. He goes, my family are those who do the will of the Father. And he began to say something that was pretty harsh. Because in essence... It, it sounded, it appeared that he was disowning his earthly family for people he really didn't know much about. He said, those who do the will of my father. In other words, he was drawing the line. He was taking them into the deep. He called the Pharisees, who were the religious folk, the ones that went to church all the time, he called them a wicked generation. He said, they were wicked. These people are wicked. Just because they go to church, they're wicked. And he declared, you are either for him or against him. He drew the line. He, he, he said, okay, here we are. You're either with me or you're against me. It, 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 was, a, it was a trying time for Jesus, I'm sure. But it really probably confused those masses who were listening to Jesus speak. It was not that I just come to hu hug you and love you. I, I've come to deal with you. Began, it began to rise up. See, Jesus is riding into the deep with his disciples in tow. After this story, Jesus went out and then he told them a parable. And he says this, how important is the parable of the farmer and the sower? Check this out. Let's go ahead and read there. In Mark chapter 4, verse 4, as he was scattering his seed, some fell along the path. Say, along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places. Say rocky places. Where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns. Say among the thorns. Which grew up and choked the plants so they did not bear grain. Still other seeds fell on good soil. Say good soil. good soil. It came up, grew, produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, and even 100 times. Then Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now what, what we he see here is a good description of what we've been talking about for the last five weeks. Is the dimensions, three dimensions. Actually there's four dimensions, but... He talked about length to measure or express length of time. But we talked about that, right? But along the path. Well, we'll get to that later. 
I, I just want to lay the groundwork for those who are trying to catch up. Lent represents a, a measure of time, right? Long suffering. And we, did, we discussed over these last four weeks, five weeks, no Lent, no stability in high seas. With its amplitude or extent, fullness, broad, to be balanced. Everything has a balance. No balance, no width, no stability. Height is knowledge, a person's understanding to have or gain knowledge. Knowledge has a way of turning a person proud. And this knowledge is an earthly endeavor, but we're, we're talking the knowledge that we want doesn't make us proud. So those are three dimensions. Stay with me. Now Matthew, Mark, and Luke both describe this same parable that I'm talking about, the parable of the, the, the farmer. The fact, this fact, leads us to believe that this principle is of most importance. Because not every parable do all the Gospels talk about. There's very few parables where they, they mention the, the same parable twice. Right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke mention this parable. We find here four places where the sea can fall. That's what I was getting. First, along the path. That represents length. Along the path. Length. So, as you're walking along the path of your, your walk with Jesus, God will begin to give you seed. Begin to give you word. Get, get, hand you things along the path. Are you with me? So even today, you're along the path, you're walking, you showed up this morning, and right now this preacher is giving you some word. What the word does depends on you, really. But it's, it happens along the path, that's part of the length, because we're building the length, width, and height of our, of our life. Rocky places represents balance. I go to the gym, well I haven't been to the gym since I got an operation, but the one thing I love to work out more than anything in the gym is my core. Everybody know what the core is? The core is your stomach, right? And what the core does, it gives you balance. When you're lifting weight, if you have a strong core, you're more, you're more apt to be able to balance yourself. When you're on a, in rocky areas, the key to, to you succeeding through the rocky area is that you have good balance, right? And so what will happen is things will come at you from the world to throw you off balance. False doctrine, lies, whatever you, you name it. It could be him or her, it could be Lance Romance or Scary Mary. <laughs> but something will throw you off balance. And it's, it's called a rocky place and you want to be careful because along the path, you'll hit a rocky place. Balance. Among the thorns represents knowledge. Interesting. When Jesus was on the cross, they put a thorns, and where did they put the thorns at? They gave him a crown of thorns, right where the knowledge rests. Where they, and the Bible says with much knowledge comes much grief. And this is where the battle is, right here in the knowledge, up here in the noggin. So, along the path, the length, in the rocky places, and among the thorns, is where God is going to build you. Now, whether he builds you depends upon one thing and one thing only. If you have good soil. Good soil. Good soil is where the deep things of God grow. You know, we, I could give you spiritual truths, and I've been giving you spiritual truths for, for the last month. But if you have no good soil, guess what? It, 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 it's no good. We've wasted time. We've had an exercise here and you gain nothing of value that, that'll help you in this walk that we call Christianity. See, the principle of the sower is so important, it affects all dimensions of your life. Sowing, seed. And the seed clearly is the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So here, these people were at the seashore. Remember earlier we read, and he, Jesus talks to the ocean. He calmed it down. Instead of saying, well, that's what Jesus is supposed to do, they were afraid. They were afraid of something that was should be natural to us. And that's what happened with most, most believers. We are so used to not experiencing the spiritual, when something spiritual happens, we get afraid. We're so used to just being in the natural. You know, we want to uh, do things out of our natural instincts. But when something spiritual happens, 
I mean, a dynamic takes place. All of a sudden, we get all afraid, like, ooh, what's really happening? And we're so backwards because that spiritual dynamic, those things taking place in our life, should be normal occurrences. It shouldn't be a strange thing that we need to go and see some big time evangelist over. No, you should be the big time evangelist. Huh? It should be happening at your house. It should be happening in your dwelling. But because we're so removed from this, we're so we're so caught up in in, in ritual, tradition, whatever you name it, everything but God and in the relationship with Him, we miss out on the deep things of God. Success is determined how, by how and where you sow. So this parable covers where you sow. Let's look at verse 10, Mark 4.10. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parable. Remember, they didn't understand what he had just said. So everybody left. He goes, hey, Jesus, what the heck are you talking about? Really, you know, you're tripping me out. He told them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Wow. Anybody like a secret? Right? But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. So that they may be ever seen, but never perceiving. And ever hearing, but never understanding. Now, this does not make sense to me. I have to digest here. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Think about that right now. But you know, people say, well, you know, Jesus came to forgive us. He's, he's love. Jesus is love. And we have all these things. God is love. We say all these things. And it's true. It's very true. But right here, he says, I'm telling you in parables because I don't want them to get forgiven. We're, we're going to the deep right now. Hello, somebody. But those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. So the key to the scripture is one thing, one thing only. The key is that you are not on the outside. See, if you're on the inside, you're okay. But if you're on the outside, the Bible doesn't want you to know what's really going on. Stay with me. Man, I'm starting to feel better already. My, 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 my sutures were hurt when I came up, but they were going away after the anointing. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? So what is he talking to, to the disciples? Now you got to understand, these disciples have been with Jesus for, for uh, several years now. And you would think they got it. You would think they had an understanding of what Jesus was talking about. But Jesus says, don't you understand? So the implication there was even though they were walking with Jesus, they were still on the outside. But don't you understand? Now, if, 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 that's a little dangerous, man. If I were the disciples, I'd start to worry right there because I go, wait a minute. He just said, if I'm on the outside, I ain't going to get forgiven. And I want to know what's going on. All of a sudden, their curiosity started peaking. Like, I need to really know and pay attention. Because I might be on the outside looking in. So that's why we talked about the ark. Because God built an ark. He's building an ark on your life. And the only good the ark will do for your life, it will only help you if you get in the ark. If you don't get in the ark, all you have is a boat to look at. And many people are so used to building a boat, and they just want to look at it, and they park it in the driveway. It's like having a, 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 a seafaring boat in Colorado. I've seen them. It makes no sense to me. Why would you have a big boat in Colorado? You know, if you're in California, yeah, but why have a big boat in Colorado? You might want to get a small little bass boat, because that's all you can use. But I've seen people, big, giant boats. There's not much water out here. Huh? The secret of the kingdom. This statement of Jesus in itself seems cold and a little callous. The secret. He speaks in parables. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. See, flesh and blood cannot receive the kingdom. Jesus is getting deeper. And here is a problem. How many of us are, are educated? Everybody raise your hands. Come on, we're all, come on, even if you, 
If you didn't graduate high school, we're educated. We are educated people. If you don't think so, go to other countries where, where, where half the populace don't even read. I was in South Africa, and 35% and, and of all city councilmen can't read. And they're running, they're running the city council. Now here's the problem. Because we're educated and we have an, a, a, an ability to understand what we read, we take in scripture and think all of a sudden we know what it's saying. And we say, oh, I understand it. I, I, got, a, I got an F in English. And I, I can read it. I know what this means. No, my friend. See, we read it in the natural. Now, you may understand uh, uh, the, the, the verbs, the pronouns, and all the other stuff, but you don't get the full meaning unless God gives it to you. That's right. But what we have, because we want to know God, we say, no, no, I got it. I understand. I got it all. I got it. I got it. I got it. Listen, most people don't got it. Amen. Uh, you know how you can tell most people don't got it? Because they don't do Christianity 101. Christianity 101, it starts at the beginning. Let's go to the beginning. Obey. All you got to do is, do they obey? If they can't obey, they can't do the rest. Do they give? And then when you begin to look at what they're really doing, if they're not doing it, they don't know what it is. They don't, they don't get a true meaning. It's tainted off of, off of their lack of understanding or tainted off of their lack of obedience. Oh, I'm getting too deep right now. So Jesus explains the parable of the sower. Let's go ahead and read there. Verse 14. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. So even right now, you heard it, right? There's somebody in here, don't look around, that I just sowed the word and the devil is yanking it because you don't like what I'm saying. Oh, stand the man. Big Red is messing with you right now. He's got you. Right? Verse 16. Let's keep reading. Others are like seeds sown in rocky places. They hear the word and want to receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So... Some immediately, the devil messes with you and pulls it and doesn't want you to listen to what I'm saying. And what it will begin to do, he'll start having you look at all my faults and believe me, I have a bunch of them. If you, if you need a list, I have one. <laughs> and so you, you, look at, you look at my faults and so you can eliminate everything I just taught you because you don't like it and you eliminate it because I'm all messed up. Right? And so the enemy tricks you. Others hear it, receive it with joy, they like it. But they have no root. In other words, they're not rooted. I think uh, the young lady testified talking about being rooted in Victor Arch, being, being committed to Victor Arch, being loyal to Victor Arch. See, you're not rooted. And what happened? As soon as one little issue comes, little child, oh, they didn't talk to my son right. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't pat little John in the head. They didn't, they didn't rub my, rub, 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 do whatever. You know what I'm saying? They get angry and they pull back. Hello, somebody. Are you with me? When persecution comes, because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, third person, are like seeds sown among thorns. They hear the word, but the worries of this life. There's one. The worries of this life. And let's face it. Life, there's a lot of worries. Right? You gotta get up. You know, but we have to learn. I, I, I've been blessed. I've been ill. Right? You're going to surgeries, it's been a blessing. Believe me. Because, you know, when I came out of my first surgery from several years ago, and the doctor said I was going to die, and I didn't die, when I seen a bill, I got happy. Yeah. You know why I got happy? Because it meant I was still alive. <laughs> See, some people we went, oh man, I got a bill. You, Colorado Spring Utilities after me, right? And Visa uh, and DirecTV, they all, they're all after you. And before, you know, we're all bum kicked. But after a while, when you realize, hey, they're after you because you're still alive, you, you start looking at things differently. So I've been blessed, right? Hello, somebody. We have a, sometimes we have a bad perspective. Uh, the worries of life. We allow those worries of life to pull us from God. I've heard, how many times have you heard? 
I'm not going to church. Why? Because I'm going through it. That's what you're supposed to be in church. Hello, is anybody home? Oh, I'm going through it. I'm not going to church. That's when you need God the most. You need to stay home. Matter of fact, it's home that's been causing you the problems. Huh? The worries of life. The second thing, the deceitfulness of wealth. See, money is funny. I tell people money doesn't just talk. It screams. It yells. It, it shouts. Deceitfulness of wickedness. Uh, deceitful, deceitfulness of wealth. Why do you think God instituted the tithe? And we can't even get people to be faithful in tithes. And they won't be faithful in tithes, but they, they think they know the word of God. It doesn't happen that way. You have to be faithful in a little. And then God will put you over much. In fact, he says, how can God trust you with the true riches? This is the true riches. If he can't even trust you with money. You think he's going to give you the real deal? Heck no. That's why he speaks in parables. That's why right now you don't, you don't even understand me. <laughs> the deceitfulness of wealth. And third, the desires of other things. Come in. I like what he says, other things. Well, what are those other things? Name it. It could be a person, place, or thing. It could be a him or a her. It could be tight jeans or whatever. Whatever comes your way, whatever tickles your fancy, it, it'll, it'll sidetrack you. Come on, you know it does. I've seen it. Oh man, I've seen guys, you know, six foot four, 250 pound buff dudes throw in their call, give up to the devil, and all she was four foot two. Let me move on. I don't even know where I went there, but it's not even in my notes. I told you I'm feeling better. It says other things. There's so many things could be other that that'll come in and separate you from God. You know, the, we, we read that scripture. What can separate us from the love of God? And he lists all these things. Paul writes and he lists you know, uh, thing after thing after thing. And says, none of that can separate you from the love of God except one thing: you. you. What you want? You're it. We've seen the enemy. And it is us. Huh? It says it'll choke the word, making it unfruitful. And that's sad because the implication there is that you have the word, you have the knowledge, you took it. As a matter of fact, you loved the knowledge, you liked it. But because of other things, life, money, whatever, came in there, it choked the word. It, it, it got rid of the meaning of the word. Uh, and you had no fruit. Just enough word to make you miserable. Not enough to produce fruit. And then others. Say others. others. This is where we, we should stay. Right here. Say, this is me. Come on, say it with kindness. This is me right here. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, they hear the word. They accept it. I like accept it because sometimes the word will tell you to do things that is not fun. It's like, man, that's a bummer. Hello? Yeah, it, it'll have you do stuff like, what? Are you kidding me? No. I got to love them? No, you're crazy. I got I to gotta what? Pray for who? No, I don't want to pray for them. I want to slap them. Yeah. Right? And the word will have you do stuff. See, we, not only do we hear the word, but we accept it. And produce a crop. Here it is. 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. So some people are like that. And I describe them, again, just for review. Or like a seed along the path. As soon as they hear it, Satan takes it away. Matthew says they hear, but don't understand. Some people are like a seed that fell on rocky places. They hear the word and ones who receive with joy. They have no root. They last only a short time. They quickly fall away. Others are like the seed that fell on the thorns. The worries of life. The deceitfulness of wealth. Choke it. Make it unfruitful. Mark says the worries of life. These thorns choke the word and make it unfruitful. 
And lastly, others would like to see the talk on good soil. Now, what is good soil? Very good. I'm coming for a landing right here. Mark says they hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Matthew says they hear the word, they understand it, and produce fruit. Luke says they hear the word and retain it and produce a crop. So you must accept it, understand it, and retain it. Mm. Mark 4.24 reads, Consider carefully what you hear. He continued, With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Think about that. This is some heavy stuff. Earlier I said that he's, he talks in parables because he doesn't want you to figure it out because you, you might get forgiven. Here he says, listen what I'm telling you. Because what little you have now, if you don't begin to produce fruit, what little you have now will be taken from you. That's pretty deep right there. Can I say it again? Let me read it again because you don't believe me. <laughs> Consider carefully what you hear. Mark 4.24 With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever doesn't have, even what he has will be taken from you. So what am I saying? Depth must produce to be considered depth. The people say, oh, I'm, getting, I'm deep, Pastor. No, no. Depth, depth produces. And then people say, they're so deep, you can't find them. They don't, they don't even know themselves. But they're producing no fruit. That's not depth. That's lost. Depth produces to be considered depth. Okay? Because, you know, people, you know, like I said, we're, we're Americans. Everybody reads. Everybody has scripture. Not only that, you can get on Google. You can Google anything. You can Google and you can, you can study the Bible, become a theologian. You can search this, search that. I got a Bible program, cost like 700 bucks. It is so deep. I mean, I'm telling you, it is like, whoa. I got to be careful. I get lost for like a week on one topic. It's just got all the information. Hmm? But if that information doesn't produce any fruit, it's not depth. It's a lot of hot air. It has to produce. Now what? That, that's between you and the Lord. But there must be a production. We're not called to be units. Or we're not called to be mules. We're called to produce after our kind. Amen? See, many have what appear to be spiritual insights, but lack the production. But the lack of production calls into question what they say they know. Too often people quote what they have read, not what they have lived. Oh, I read this, and they quote it. That sounds good. And they got all the quotes. They, can, they come and they give you all the, bro, I've been studying the Word of God. And then it has revealed it to with me. If, some of the greatest of words. And I am the deepest of deepest. <laughs> but you look at their life, it, it doesn't match up to what they're talking about. Uh, you look at their life, they should be reading the Playboy instead of the Bible. Let me move on. Uh, it doesn't match up. It, it's, it's all twisted. Hello, hello somebody. See, God, good soil accepts, understands, and retains the knowledge given by the Spirit. Then they proceed to produce. See, God spoke deep to the deep. The parable of the sower, verses 1 through 9. The purpose of parables, verse 10 down to 25. Mm. The parable of the growing seed, verse 26 to 29. The parable of the mustard seed, verse 30 to 32. If you keep reading the scripture, 
parable after parable, and he's giving spiritual truths, and he's doing it that way so that, again, that people wouldn't understand it completely unless they were walking in the deep and they were producing. See, the moment you produce, if it's just one soul, you leave one person to the Lord. The moment you produce, then you, ha you have obligated God, the Holy Spirit, to begin to reveal His Word to you. Mm. He can't hide from you no more. You've obligated Him. Why? Because now you're producing. But see, if you don't produce, then you can read the Word forever reading, for, but never learning. Forever perceiving, but never seeing. That's what He was talking about. So it's so important that wherever you're at, I don't care where you are, if you've been saved a day or, or, or 10 years, that you must produce. Because once you produce, God is obligated to teach you. Mm. I don't know about you, but I want God to teach me. I want to learn to be deep in God. I want to grow in His grace. I want to, I want to mature. I don't want to stay the same. I'm not satisfied with who I am, who I was yesterday or, 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 or this morning. I want to be completely different every single day. Every day. Let's read verse 33. And I'm coming in for a landing. I'll bring my piano player up to give you hope. <laughs> We're going to do that. Verse 33. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. Remember, discipleship to calm the high seas. Now he pulled them aside. He goes, you, I'm going to leave. Jesus knew who he was going to leave. He said, I'm going to leave these 12 guys here. i got to make exact replicas of me. I'm leaving. So he began to explain to them. He goes, I have to put it to these 12 because they're it. They're the plan. And he began to explain everything to them. And then he takes them, after he explained the parables, that's when he said, okay, you guys got it? We go to school. We say, yeah, I got it. Are you sure you got it? Yeah, I got it. Are you really sure? I got it. Okay, let's get on the boat. And then he takes them to a storm. That's why he said, why are you guys afraid? We just had this class. I just talked to you about this parable. I healed this person. I told you who my family was. I, I, I went through everything for these last several days. Now, you said you had it. I take you on a dumb boat, and you get afraid. Why are you afraid? I've been teaching faith for the last week, and you haven't got it yet? That's when you pick up the story in verse 39. Then he arose and rebuked the wind. And said to the sea, peace be still. See, stability on high seas. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? If Jesus lives in you, then his desire to explain the depth of these parables is for your life. God's desire is for us to be like Jesus, to stand up in the midst of the storm and command the, the sea to be still. Command it. Order it. He wants to bring us to the other side of the water to see the works and the wonders of the deep. Psalm 107, verse 23 reads like this. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. When I was first attacked physically, I knew it was a spiritual attack. It was demonic. And I said, okay, God, if this is what I have to go through, then let's do this. I'm okay. Right? And then when I'm sitting, I'm sitting there, August 23rd, I had a dream, and the Lord says, you're not going to die. 
I'm going to heal you. The God of David will heal you. Like I, you know, when, you're, when you think you're going to die and God says you're not going to die, you're kind of, it's kind of a good day. That's a good day. And I said, okay. He goes, I'm going to heal you. So instantly in our humanity, we begin to doubt. I'm on the sea, there's a storm. And um, you're doubting. Now God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling here with this right now. Doesn't look, doesn't look good. And all of a sudden God begins to move in signs and wonders. And I don't know if I share this with some, I'll share it again. They're taking me to the fourth floor because they said they want to give me dialysis. So I said, you don't have to give me dialysis. God healed me. And they said, yeah, right. I said, no, no, God healed me. And he said, no, no, you, you have liver failure, you have kidney failure, you have bowel failure. We need to get you to the fourth floor. I go, no, God healed me. I had a dream last night that God had David to heal me. I'm healed. Well, we're arguing. I was arguing with the nurse, right? And the doctor comes in. I go, doc, I've been healed. And she's not listening to me. The God David healed me. And he looks at me. He goes, well, you know, you kind of look better. I go, I told her, I know I look better. God healed me. He's, he's looking at me. He goes, okay, nurse, take his vital signs. They take my vital signs. He comes back about 20 minutes later. He goes, I don't know what it is, but your vital signs are better. Everything came back on. Remember, my, my liver was off. My bowels were off. My kidneys had failed. Everything. I had swelled up and gained 30 pounds of water weight. Right? And I go, I told you that God of David healed me. He goes, but we got to take you to the fourth floor because they want to give me dialysis. I'm like, I don't know. You're not going to pop me open like that. No, you don't have to. So what happened, as they began to roll me out the door, the wheel of my bed fell off. Now, I don't know about you, but I got kind of excited. <laughs> because all of a sudden, God began to manifest. See, when God is in it, God begins to move in miracles. The wheel of my bed fell off. So the lady is pushing my bed. The back will fall off. She starts screaming. The nurse, I see you. Screaming, the wheels was he's screaming, yelling, and I'm kind of happy, like, yeah, this is cool right now. So I know God healed me, and you ain't taking me to the fourth floor. Oh, oh. So she grabs the back of the bed, starts pushing forward, in runs another nurse, and what happens? She goes, I don't know, but the wheels fall off. I begin to tell that nurse, God said he's going to heal me. I've been healed. I don't need to go to the fourth floor. Everything's fine. I'm going to get better. And he looks at me like, yes, Mrs. Loma. I go, no, you don't believe me either. The front wheels fall off. <laughs> There's no wheels on my bed. Now I'll take me to the fourth floor. <laughs> so she grabbed the fourth, front of the bed. The other nurse grabbed the back of the bed. In coming two more orderlies. They walk in. What's going on? They're yelling. The wheels are falling off. And I'm telling them, no, the wheels ain't falling off. God has healed me. I don't have to go to the fourth floor. God is doing the work of my life. He already told me what's going to take place. And I begin to testify to them. Now they look at me like I'm crazy. Right? But God is moving. Why? Because God was doing something in my life to prepare me for you. To walk into the deep. And we do serve a God of miracles. We, we don't just serve a, a, a make-believe God. It's not just something we come here because we want to be good people. Look, I don't just want to be a good person. That's no fun. Say with me. Huh? No, I want to be a radical person. I want to be sold up, radical for Jesus. I mean, hope to die, Christian, Jesus, freak, slap the devil upside the head kind of dude. That's what I want to be. That's all I want to be. All I ever wanted to be was, was, was be a man of God and serve God and preach the gospel. Well, but it doesn't just, it's not just my gig. It has to happen in your heart. It has to happen in you. I wish I could just jump out and, and jump into you and tell you how important you are to the gospel of Jesus Christ. How important your call is. You can't just sit around waste time and think this is a game. No, my friend, life is short. Life is so short. And the older you get, when you start hitting 50, none of your business, you get to start picking up speed. And you get older quicker and quicker and quicker. Life is short. So what are you going to do with God? What are you going to do with the deep things of God? So you should want to move out in the, in the miracles. You should want to be able to lay hands on the sick that they might recover. You should want to be able to let your shadow pass somebody and let them be healed. If Peter can do it, then why can't we? Why can't we? 
Mm. There's no reason why we can. We just have to believe. We speak to the sea and calm them. Mark 5. I'm going to read this. Check this out. I'm going to end with this. I'm, I'm trying to end. After the class of calming the sea. Remember the class. Chapter 3. He was the devil. His, his, his family thought he was crazy. He goes in the water. Begin to talk to him about, about the spiritual things. Parables. He, then he takes the, the disciples into the boat. And he calms the sea. Right? And he's trying to show them their power. Their authority. Remember I started with authority. He's trying to show the disciples their authority. Then you come to chapter 5. They came to the other side of the sea. The deep. You're going to go to the deep. Are you with me? They came to the other side of the sea. To the region of the Gerasenes. And as soon as he got out of the boat, there met him out of the tombs a man under the power of of an unclean spirit. So this man continually lived among the tombs and no one could subdue him, even with a chain. He was bound. Come on, don't you see the picture? That's why we're called the treasures out of darkness. Right. We, 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 we come in contact with people that are bound with, with, by so many vices, by so many destructive ways. Huh? These men, this, this man represents the people that were called to reach out of the tombs. It says no one had enough strength to restrain him. All that teaching was to get him to that point on the other side of the sea mm. so that he could deal with the person. Amen. People that you know, that I know, friends, family, Relatives, come on, we know some crazy mm. folk, don't we? Let me say it again. We know some crazy folk, don't we? Yeah. We do. And that's what we're called to reach. They don't have to stay that way. We have the power. Verse 5. Night and day, among the tombs on the mountains, he was always shrieking and screaming and beating and bruising and cutting himself with stones. And when from a distance he saw Jesus, he ran and fell on his knees before him in homage and cried out with a loud voice. He said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? What is there in common between us? I solemnly implore you by God, do not begin to torment me. For Jesus was commanding, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Okay, there it is. So now I charge every one of you to go home to your friend's house and pray for somebody. And take authority. You don't have to tell them what you're doing. But take authority in your life. Mm. You know, you know that's how naive I was, when I still am. When I first came to Colorado Springs, you know what I used to do to people? Right? See, you see my shadow? My shadow over here, what the light. I just walked in the streets because I didn't know anybody. And I would talk to them. And I'd let my shadow hit them. <laughs> I did. Because I said, if Peter's shadow can, he can heal and change people's lives, yeah. so can mine. So, so I did. Come on, all right. And I let my shadow hit them. And people said, that didn't work. It didn't? How many people I got here? Time my shadow and hit you. Amen. I didn't shadow you up. <laughs> huh? Why did I believe if we have that authority, then we have that authority. Yeah. Right. So you need to go find somebody, let your shadow hit them. Right. Start believing God that you know I'm, this man's life is gonna change. They don't have to be the, no, like this no more. Why? Right. Because the Bible says I have authority. And Jesus has all authority in heaven I give to you. And in fact, Jesus says, greater things than these shall you do in my name greater. And Jesus did a lot of good things, a lot of great things that we got to get on our giddy up. What are we waiting for? What are you waiting for? There's somebody out there that needs you to get on them. And stop getting caught up on these little kid games. 
Oh, this guy hurt my feelings. She's not mad at me. So we get caught up in these little elementary stuff and we don't get right down to the real deal. Well, we're here to save souls. We're here to win people to Christ. We're here to do something for God. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Can you hear me? I'm not talking to America right now. I'm going to be about here very close. Every body, every eye close. I'm praying that people would walk into the deep, that you would take your authority right where you're at. It's not just about coming to church, it's more than that. You need to take authority. I don't care what situation you're in, calm that sea, mm. speak to it in Jesus' name. Peace be still. You take it over. Huh? You're in charge. You're the head. Not the tail. You're the top. You're the king of kings. Huh? You, you we serve the Lord of Lords. We serve the Almighty One, the creator of the heaven and the earth. That's who you serve. You're his child. You're his son. You're his daughter. He's given you that anointing. You just gotta grab a hold of it. Take it. It's yours. You don't have to ask for it anymore. It's yours. He gave it to you. This morning, if you want that anointing, if you want that from God, if you really, really want that, I want you to come forward. The altars are open. It is power.